I, I just maybe he I, trimmed I, the beard. I just climbed out of bed, so. <laughs> well, now everybody knows you just climbed out of bed. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, welcome. We are live. Thank you for joining us. This is Comic Book Conservation Live Show Episode 6. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Kosnick. I have with me, as usual, Captain Larry. Say hi. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Flying L Comics and Phantom Phil. Say hi. Howdy. Hey, everybody. Phantom Restoration. How was your week? Who wants to go first? <laughs> Larry? Actually, Larry, why don't you just tell us what continent you're on? Let's start with yeah, that. We're, we're... I, I am in Asia currently. I'm in uh, just outside of Seoul, South Korea. I just landed oh, wow. here from chi China uh, about four hours ago. Wow. <laughs> so Incredible. It, it really is. I, I'm confident that would not be the lifestyle for me. I am. Um, All right. I it's don't think I are. could handle the physiologic uh, toll of being in so many time zones so many times. It's, I, well, I think it, it would be taxing on me. It, Hats it, off. Well, you, you end up sleeping for about four hours at a, in, in four hour blocks. Even when you're home on days off, it's four mm. hour blocks. <laughs> so you just, uh, you grab what you can and try not to fatigue out yesterday was a little bit trying and you know it's, it's pouring buckets of rain right now it's slamming i don't know if you can hear it or not it's slamming against my window no. in the hotel mm, you can't so, hear it at all good i was in, it looks uh, sunny from the window i was in you. south korea once for a conference lovely place i really enjoyed it it it, it is uh we're just outside of seoul in uh in incheon from man-made man cities, one of their their technological marvels, where they re reclaimed all the land from the ocean. Uh, I think that's literally where I was, actually. if I recall correctly. And um, you, okay, I found the people delightful, really, very welcoming and warm. Yeah, and yeah I, I really very, enjoyed very, it. Very, very polite. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, the Korean culture is is uh, they're good people. They are. Well, we're glad to have you. We're glad you're on a, a, a leg where you're in a hotel room and could join us. Phil, how was your week? Uh, very good. I actually, uh, I don't watch much television, but as I was just eating my dinner, I was watching the first episode of the new uh, Fallout series. And I, I oh, played yeah. the game extensively in college and I was fanboying hard. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so far it seems very good. And I'm excited to at least watch uh the next episode and uh that aside just as busy as ever with work and um yeah. and, and all that good stuff so yeah it's been uh i've been busy this week it's spring here what's i mean it's spring i guess everywhere in the northern hemisphere but it there's a lot of yard work out here and i've been in the yard i got a little bit of sun and um i've been busy it's almost uh some folks know that one of my other hobbies is actually bird watching and and the migration is starting as well so that's been fun to get outside i like to get outside every day if i can just be um you know in some quiet space and i got to do some of that this week so while it was a very busy week um part of it was doing things I really enjoy. So I had a great week. Well, one thing I got to do yesterday, which is actually a lot of fun, I was in uh, Chengdu, China, which is where the giant panda breeding center is. Mm. So I went to the giant panda breeding center. That was fascinating. I, I got to wow. see lots of baby pandas, and it, it, it's an amazing 167-acre facility. It makes Disney World look like nothing. Wow. Uh, I think, I, I, I mean, I, I guess checked. you need a lot of you need a lot of habitat, right? You need a lot of space it, for that. Yeah, a lot of bamboo, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think I walked. I think I clocked in close to ten miles of walking. Wow! It was it was huge, just a huge, huge facility. What a great opportunity! Oh, well, really cool. You know, if you're going to be a pilot and be stuck all around the world, take advantage of find, it, right? So find that's some great. place. Yeah, that's find awesome. something to do when you're on layover. Very yep. awesome. So, hey, Peter, good to see you here. Don C., Nicholas Smart, um, all members of our, I'm going to plug it here at the hey, beginning everybody. of the show this time, hey, all members of our nice. comic book conservation 
community Facebook group where this conversation spills over and many more. Very collaborative, supportive group. If you're interested in comic book conservation, restoration removal, anything like that, check it out. Come say hi. It's growing every week. And like I said, very supportive community. And uh, appreciate those of you that are joining us from there. We have two segments today. And we're going to start say, off. I'm going to be joining. Um, I don't have a Facebook page right. uh, for Phantom at all. And I just want to say, if it's any incentive for anyone else to join the Facebook group, uh, this week, I'm going to get my, my page up and I'm going to join because it's been something I've been meaning to do every time. You know, cool. we go over this, uh, you know, in the segments, I, I uh, intend to do it. And this week, I'm going to make it on that. So. You hear that? Facebook yeah, awesome. is not just for old people anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, Phil's just getting old. Yeah, yeah, right <laughs> <middle>. Phil's <laughs> aged into the Facebook. <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm, I, I am genuinely interested in seeing the conversation being a part of the, the conversation there is, is the, the part of well, it. So. You know, our, our little sub hobby of conservation, uh, a bunch of corners of the main hobby are hostile toward it. And the reason I created sure. the group is because I got sick and tired of that. I, one of our current members posted something somewhere else in the internet and had a whole bunch of really jerky responses to it. And I said, you know what? We need our own space where mm -hmm. um, we can support one another. And um, so um, that's what it's about. So it'd be great to have you there, Phil. Really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to being a part of it. So uh, as I was saying, we have two segments today, and we're going to start off with this continuing segment, What Are Conserved and Restored Comic Books Worth? This has been a lot of fun. I'm actually enjoying putting together this segment on weeks where I'm not doing my own conservation work. And I think it is important because one of the concepts is like, why conserve books? Sure. You want to preserve what's left. Most of our conservation candidates are relatively low-grade books that probably aren't going to survive if we don't do a conservation on them. And that's great. It makes you maybe feel good to save a comic book that you like. But it's nice also to know that there's some equity created when you do it. Or at least know what the limit of the equity is so that you know how much exactly. time to put into something, how much effort it's really worth. So that's the point of this segment. And um, we got some great candidates this week. There was a... Yeah, I love this. There was a big heritage. Uh, wait, was it heritage? Uh, yeah, this is a heritage. Actually. It was heritage it, that ended on yeah. the 8th, I believe. I'll have, yeah, the, I'll have the info in a moment. And this is an interesting book. This Avengers 7.5 is a conserved book, but this is in the early conserved label. So it has yeah, the purple, yeah, yeah the, the purple bar across the top. And so I think this potentially throws people off. They think this book is restored yeah. and maybe they shy away from it. There might be opportunities in books like this. So for those of you not aware, when CGC first started the conserved category of assigning grades, this was the label. It was blue rather than the whole thing being purple, like restored. It was blue with a purple bar. And so this is in fact a conserved book, not a restored book. And it sold on the eighth and the book to the left sold actually also in a heritage auction, I believe in January, but we'll have the data in a moment. So just a few months apart, same exact platform. So great opportunity for us to look at the relative value of these two books. A little bit of background, Avengers 1, 1964. I believe it's actually January, first month. Same month as X-Men number one, by the way. Uh, obviously, first appearance of the Avengers. Median grade on Avengers 1 is actually a lowly 4.0. Um, but there are well over 4,000 wow. universal, almost 600 signature series, probably all of them Stan Lee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. He, he just signed so many books, bless him. Um, almost 700 restored, 84 qualified, only 16 conserved. That's why when we see one of these, we really want to talk about it because we just yeah. don't have that many opportunities to talk about these conserved books So there, because there are so few of them. 
Fair market value on a universal 7.5. Now, this is the, the screen grab from GoCollect, which I do subscribe to. They don't sponsor the show or anything, but I, you know I'm using the data, so I want to credit the source. I don't. They have an algorithm, and if an if a grade of directly above or below sells for a really aberrant number, it will pull this number up. And so I'm gonna. I I don't think this 14.5 maybe is quite accurate. No, I. Yeah, We're gonna I don't go think into so that, at all. Yeah. but. Let's. I want to draw people's attention to a, a few things here. 7.5 is a very high grade for this book. This is top 6% in the census. So we're talking tall cotton here. Also, look at the highest price ever paid for this book in Universal 7.5, $25,200. That's a chunk of change, people. Um for a funny book. That was at the tail end of COVID when all the prices spiked up. Um, Now, again, if you look at the 12 month trailing range, it ranges from 11,100 to 13,200 on this book. And like I said, uh, go collect has an algorithm. So they have this book pinned at 14, five, but I'm going to explain why. And then I'm going to give you my rationale for what I think the book is really worth. The reason they have it pegged at 14, five is because the last sale in Edo, which was just from um, six weeks ago, went for 16.8. So that algorithm, it doesn't like big jumps in the data, and it tries to smooth that curve out. So this 16.8 sale, hey, Travis, this 16.8 sale pulled up the fair market value of the 7.5 in GoCollect's algorithm. And it is the point at which the values start to go nonlinear. Uh, an 8.0 is yeah. top 4.7% of the census. So you're so really, you're really ready. getting into the very high grades here. So who's to say if a 7.5 should be 14.5 or not? But I'll tell you what the market is saying. The last two sales were for exactly 11100 uh, in J- on January 14th, we had a sale through Heritage. That's the book that I featured that okay. sold through and hammered at 11100 with the buyer's premium and had uh, cream to off-white pages. Uh, the one right above that sold March 1st on eBay. And this is something I don't know if everybody knows you can do this. So eBay doesn't give you this data. The, the data... If you look at eBay, it says the asking was 16599 yeah. and it says best offer accepted. But there are websites that will scrub eBay's like hidden data and can tell you what it actually sold for. And so I pulled this data off of one of those websites. It also sold for exactly 11100 So the last two sales are right here at 11100 That's what I'm going to call the value of the book I agree in with Universal that. 7.5. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's what I used for the for the sort of comparison. Now, this book, really super interesting. I want to talk about this book. I want to hear what you both have to say about it and also what the what the audience has to say. So I was I was really looks, surprised by this. It looks great, right? Oh, yeah. Here are the notes and the uh, only conservation oh. is staples replaced. So there you go. this particular book has some rust migration into the paper. It is basically otherwise almost flawless. There are a couple of tiny uh, spine ticks, but it's a beautiful book with a little bit of rust migration. So somebody replaced the staples and that's why it's got a conserved grade. So it is essentially exactly the same as the other seven five, but with replaced staples. And if you look at the page quality, it's white. The other one was cream. So, and this is also graded almost 10 years ago. Yeah. 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 That's true. So Um, maybe they may have had a different perspective on how they're still in that learning curve for calculating what's true. In all certainty, it probably wasn't dry cleaned or pressed, which is funny too. So it's probably an eight. I mean, I, I'm. I don't want to 
I don't want to misspeak here, but it does look just from the front cover. I don't see anything. It looks good, yeah. That keeps it out of a eight or an eight five range, you know. So that's it's a right. quite a desirable copy for sure. So before we get to the hammer prices, knowing what you know now, the one on the right has replaced staples, has white page. The one on the left has the original staples and cream to off white. Just looking at the two of them and knowing what you know, which book would you rather own? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'd like I'd like to have the universal one just because it's the, the blue label, but the uh, the conserved one looks phenomenal. You know, I my my temptation would be to uh, can I do something more with it? <laughs> but uh, I would probably leave it in the slab. But I don't know. I would I would take either one of those. But yeah, so yeah, I, I'd be happy to have either in the collection. How yeah, about you, really? Phil? I mean, the only question, really, as far as I'm concerned, is well, what's the price? How much am I paying? Because that's right. what it would come down. You to. want to know how much of a discount you get before you decide? <laughs> no, okay, well, no, no, but, well but, okay. What sure. would you price? That's fair. You I mean, price? that's what fair. Would, what, what would you price it at looking at it, knowing what you know? I think. I think. I think outside of the world of CGC, both of these books should be the one on the left should be valued only slightly higher, in my opinion. Um, but based on what we see here, I would say that the conserve grade, I wouldn't be surprised if it went as high as 80% of the unrestored value. Um, well, so those yeah, of you that it, don't know, I uh, I think uh, Captain Larry knows what it went for. I don't know if he knows the fair. I don't know. Value, I have no but... idea. I Phil really, doesn't know because we don't really, always yeah. we yeah, don't I, always collaborate yeah, on these segments. Yeah, I caught I caught this one live, and it was it was it was it was, was eye popping. Actually, I did not S expect it to go for what it did. I am not surprised, and I'll tell you, I personally even even money, I would rather have the conserved book. I'm with I'm with. Um, I think Travis said so. Yeah, Travis agrees, and here's my rationale. It's a better book. It just doesn't have its original staples. Um, page quality is nice. You can yeah, see, look a, at the spine really, ticks. Look at the spine yeah. ticks in Loki's shoulder. Mm -hmm. On the on the universal one. Uh, yeah. The conserved one just looks a lot better. Silver it's a, it's Age books too. Book. Any anytime you see cream, it turns off a lot of people. Even if yeah, that's I don't I don't want the cream white. pages. I to me, I'd much rather have white pages with with replaced staples than cream pages yeah. personally. I, so I have here's a lot the to say, but I, yeah, let's, let's enough, see. enough uh, suspense. Good. Here's the hammer price on the conserved book. So we already established that the universal is worth 11,100. So this is uh, close to 90% of the value. Of so the other thing that, that affects it is, is this is a, a blue chip key. And mm -hmm. the rarity and that grade also drives the price. If you take an average, you know, common book, uh, Hulk 181, perfectly. There's so many of those out in the census right now. You, I don't think you're going to get an equal. If that, if you had a Hulk 181 that was conserved like this, I don't think you would get that 90. percent No, I don't think so either. Um, here you go. Incredible. Hardly any discount at all. It's <laughs> worth um, like I. I Somebody who's better at math or quicker at math, I guess, can, can do <laughs> it, but it's like 87% of the universal value. Uh, yeah, that's funny. Isn't that great? My my rationale for saying so high too, which I know is kind of against the standard what we, you know, uh, uh, projections that we have when we talk about the restored and conserved versus universal, but um, the notation of staples replaced is one of those one things that I see and I'll see books routinely sell for higher than they would otherwise, you know, to the, to the unsuspecting uh, uninformed buyer. So. Yeah. So it matters what work was done. You know, this is a theme, but it matters, right? It's just, you don't, you can't just look at it and say, Oh, conserved. I know what discount to apply. It matters what the book is. It matters the paper yeah. quality. It matters what work was done. So, yeah. Kudos to whoever did this work and sure. um, well sold, I think. Well bought, probably too, but well sold for sure. That Mike's here. Hey, Mike, Mike yeah. agrees with us as well. He'd rather have the conserved copy. Yeah. Uh, anything else to say about that book? We have, we have one more. 
to talk about. We're going to stay in the Marvel Silver Age. This time we're going to talk about a restored book. And you'll start to see themes as we, as we do these. Um, here's a key, a huge key for some people. You know what's interesting? I never thought this book was that big of a deal myself. It, it's, it's actually the cover art that drives it. Um, it may be, but I've also, I've, I've seen people, people who I respect say that they think this is the most important book of the entire Silver Age. One of the few and I, books that I've still, you know, have my. I don't of. get that argument yeah. because I'm kind of like, look, DC had already been for what seven years by now, re bringing back all their Golden Age heroes and reimagining them. So this isn't groundbreaking to me in that regard. Um, it's not a first appearance. Otherwise, I, I, you know, hey, I hey, actually hey, I have a full run of Avengers Volume One. It, it was my favorite you know, <laughs> collecting book as a kid. And, um, I obviously, I own this book and I'm not, I'm not hating on it, but at the same time, I never, to me, it's just a silver age book. It's not like yeah, a grail of the silver age for me, but, um, for some folks it really is. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it today. Well, well uh, and, I'll talk and about by the way, If you guys want to voice, um, you know, dissent to that, please feel free. <laughs> Larry, what are your feelings? <laughs> Uh, this is one of my personal grails. Uh, oh, I, I, I enjoyed this book. Uh, I actively seek it when I can get a deal on one. Um, I've had a few of them, you know, pass through my hands. Uh, I just recently had one that was a Stan Lee signed copy that I've had people just go nuts trying to buy. And uh, I, I like it. It's great classic Kirby art. And yeah. uh, it, I just think it's just a really cool book. So when I when first the first one I ever had in my hands, it was just like, wow, this is this is one of the grails. And yes, the Avengers number one, I'd like to have one of those as well. But that's about, <laughs> that's outside my play money range. So maybe mm -hmm. maybe one of these days. But Paul, yeah, this I, is a per, this is a personal favorite for me. I I had your exact sentiments for the longest time, and then somewhat recently I was rethinking re re it. And, and looking at it, how like Stan was being so ambitious with the characters, like, you know, Tony Stark, the, the antithesis of what the 60s counterculture liked, he, he made a likable superhero. And with this, it's like, like Captain America, like, isn't fighting. Not, there's no Nazis in the 60s. Who's he supposed to be fighting? So to me, that's the like, it's ambitious yeah. to bring back Captain America. Like, who's he supposed to be? Like, it's just such a, to me, that's that sole reason was enough to be like, he yeah. shouldn't be there. Why? Why is he being drawn back? <laughs> it work. A man out of time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, man out of ice out of yeah. time. Yeah. Well, like I said, I'm not hating on the book. I own it, and um, I I own yeah. a complete run of the Avengers. I I just it's not don't comparable it, to the other. I just don't put it in that ones. level with yeah. the other big keys for for the Marvel age. Yeah, personally, those are the first um, appearances. This is just the reintroduction. So, in that yeah. regard, I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. yeah. So these two books sold, I believe, within three months of one another. We'll get a look at that. Um, the one on the right, the restored one, just hammered in that heritage sale on the 8th. So let's do a little background on this book. First Silver Age cap, as we talked about. Still 1964. This is, I think, April um, cover date, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe March. March. Median grade here is a 5.0, so probably fewer total of the ones that exist in the census. The real beaters are left as reader copies yeah. um, because we have just a little over 4,000 in the census as opposed to 5,000 uh, for number one. 461 signatures, uh, of which Captain Larry apparently has one. <laughs> 500 restored, 81 qualified, 19 conserved. So we're going to be looking at one of these 500 restored copies. First, we're going to talk about the value, fair market value for Universal 7.0. So Universal 7.0 sits today at about 2,500. Notice it really hasn't taken quite the beating that a lot of other books have had um, post the COVID boom, it's held its value better than average for, for yeah. this tier of book, I would say. 
top 21.5% of the census 7.0. So not quite the rare high grade that we saw with the issue of Avengers 1, but still a, a nice, I consider 7.0 like upper mid grade myself. I don't quite call 7.0 high grade personally, but uh, if somebody wanted to argue with me about it, I would, I would uh, pass. High watermark for this book, 5,520 back in the pandemic, trailing 12 month average, 2650 to 3950. That's still a lot of volatility yeah. in the pricing. They have the fair market value pegged at 2,500 because of the last few sales. And that is the low end, but maybe the market is finally correcting in this book. So I did not, um, I, I didn't want to necessarily argue with that, but here's the book we're actually looking at. Sold January 24th. This is the last universal 7.0 that sold in a public forum. Three grand for this book, as opposed to, you know, again, go collect algorithm smoothing out the data. I think yeah. the 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 one year average is 3149. So I think this three grand for the last sale is is probably a, a better, better indicator function. of the market. Yeah. And nice paper quality on this one, off white. This is definitely a beautiful book, date stamped, Mike. So perfect for you. Here are the graders' notes on the restored 7.0. One hundred dollars. Oh, heritage. I <laughs> <Sorry>. think <laughs> guilty. Okay. Uh, multiple crease cover breaks, small amount. So here's the actual restoration, small amount of color touch on cover. Now, they, Heritage has very large scans. So I was able to scan over this, and it, it even says left bottom front cover, left center, left bottom back, and it says left center front cover. I'll tell you, left center seems like it would have to be either Giant Man's right arm or the Wasp because everything else is white. The bottom could be anything because there's a black field. But what's interesting is whoever color touched it, there's like abrasions in that black field. They could have touched those and they didn't. So it's not clear to me, and I couldn't see exactly where the color touch is. So I do believe it is a small amount. It certainly is not a massive amount of color touch here. This may be something to think about. We talked about not all restoration is equal, right? So... Yep. Maybe somebody was looking at this as a fixer upper where they might um, take a bet that they could do but some gamble. restoration yeah. removal, that they could gamble on removing that color touch. Cream to off white, though, so lower grade of paper here than we saw in the universal copy as well. It hammered for 1920, which I actually thought was a strong number for this book. Um, yeah, given that we put, I'll, I'll the, we put that, the other yeah. book at three grand, it's a, it's basically two thirds, sixty five percent, sixty seven percent, something like that. Thoughts? Like, there's a lot of compression and uh, around that price point and grades, just because there's so many copies available. I think that's one of the things. I agree. So it, it really is. It's it's funny how only a couple hundred dollars more you can get a slightly nicer copy, and then you start playing that game with how much more and when you want to stop. Um, so I think, I don't know, I, I view books like this conservatively. I would say this could be a 5.5 five or a 6 universal. So look at what those are going for. And otherwise, you're in a best case scenario and ends up coming back higher and you win. But I would imagine uh, a 5.5 five or a 6 universal might go for uh, less than this person paid for this copy here. So, it, you know, um, but I yeah, win. I think this was well sold, frankly. I, yeah. I think we're looking at silver age books that aren't mega keys that have a lot of inventory typically are closer to a third to a half of the universal value. Yeah. that's um, what This I was being at two thirds, I think is a really strong sale. I think the person probably was potentially looking at the equity that they might be able to create with a restoration removal. The, the one thing this book does have going for it is I do think it's a very small amount of color touch because I couldn't see it even in very large scans. And 7.0 is starting to be, you know, not quite high grade in my book, but 
but definitely a very collectible investment grade book. So um, I do think it has that going for it. But yeah, I, this is a bit more than I would have paid. I would very much rather have the universal book here. And, and to me, it's not yeah. close, yeah. even with the discount, frankly. No. I agree. Even when looking at restoration and removal of candidates, and it can be tough to gauge, but I hate to admit, I'll, I'll see creamed off white and I'll be like, mm, depends on the price. <laughs> but yeah. I'm, I'm more deterred by that and I, I don't want to be. I just am. Yeah. Um, so my takeaway is the Heritage Auction brought some very strong prices for conserved and restored comic books. Is this the beginning of a trend? We'll continue to follow it, and we will let you know what we think. Um, for those that might say, well, Heritage always brings high prices, our, our, our comparison books were also Heritage books. So I think that's a non-factor here. Bronzeville, welcome to the conversation. I will highlight this comment. Let's see. Let's go to this view. Uh, let's go to this view, and let's highlight... Cap is such an integral part of Avengers history. So true. Coming back into the narrative is hugely important. Marvel took a different path. That's for sure. Agree with all those things. And it is true, right? So Cap is not a founder, but he's the, the constant in the first hundred issues. Um, he's, he's literally the only member who's a constant from issue four through 100. And so I do think... He becomes the heart and soul of the team, especially the way Roy Thomas takes it over. So, I, I you know, like I said, I'm not going to put up a, a really big argument against this. I just kind of throw in my opinion out. DC reimagined the characters yeah. use Earth 2 to bring back the Golden Age characters. Stan Lee kept a linear storyline. True. And um, also, how ridiculous is it that the original Earth is Earth 2 and then the <laughs> new made-up Julia Schwartz Earth is Earth 1? I mean, <laughs> how <laughs> how egocentric were they <laughs> <laughs> i agree with you travis seller did well on the sale of that uh of that restored book hey shelby welcome welcome to the conversation um so are we ready for our next segment can i just just yeah. uh can you give me ten seconds? those questions i just want to say I count down on phil hey dad if you're watching Zing! This is my copy. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> it's one of the few uh, remaining PC books that I've I haven't got rid of over the years. But um, Ooh. I'm a big fan. it's a nice, a nice yeah, copy. Keep that one. I, 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 I like that. That's a great copy. Respect. That's uh, that's that's higher grade than the one I have in my PC. Uh, Travis says no GRR for Avengers 1. They went with four. Oh, golden record reprint. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good point. Yeah. Well, definitely Stan loved that book. St I mean, you know, Stan loved Cap, and he worked on him a bit in the Golden Age. I think that was that thing where Stan was actually younger than Kirby and Simon, and he worshipped those guys, so he kind of worshipped their original work and and was a big fan of uh, Cap. So it makes sense also that Stan himself was fanboying a little bit of you know Jack Kirby on on Captain America. So sure. and to, to your point about Cap not fighting the Nazis, you know he's actually after that issue, all of his solo tales are over in Tales of Suspense, and he does fight the Nazis for the first year of Tales of Suspense, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. They, they, had to, they had to fill those pages somehow. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our next segment. So in this segment, this is our ongoing segment for my copy of... Adventure Comics number 61. I don't know if David is in the house, but he'll be jealous if he is. Uh, so those of you that recall, I won this book in auction. And prior to winning it, it, it was a qualified book. And I actually reached out to Phil and we talked about what we thought the potential was and we agreed to collaborate on it. 
And then I did an unboxing of this and a walkthrough in one of our earlier episodes of the comic book conservation live show. And then I shipped it off to Phil. And so now it's in his hands and he's going to do the conservation work on it. So with that, do you want the next slide, Phil? Yeah, sure. Larry, you, you want to say something? Yeah, I was going to say for everybody who's just you know checking on to this, we'll summarize what the qualified uh, mm. on this book was. Well, maybe actually I'll provide, I'll do one better. So for those of you that don't know, this is the first appearance of Starman. <laughs> and um, Starman's one of the members of the JSA, joins the team in All-Star 8, which is a key book for some other odd reason, I don't know, other than Starman joining the team. And it was qualified because, Phil? Oh, I was going to say, you can reveal the, the, the oh, reason why that. It had, it had some married pages. Ah, okay. Yep. yep. And it also had, uh, well, some tape and some other issues that I think yep. Phil's going to talk about. But, but the reason it was qualified is it had married pages. So we recognized this as a potential fixer-upper because, of course, Green Label sells at a pretty significant discount to Universal. Um, but married pages are allowed in conservation. So the conserved label, we think, would be, get potentially both a grade bump and not as much of a discount to Universal. So we went through the math, but we thought potentially we're creating maybe as much as $2,000 equity here if things go our way. Remind me, because this was sent raw again, just off, off the top of my head. I can't remember. What was the technical grade on this again? It was a 1.8 or 1.8? I think it was 1.8. I do I think it was 1.8, right? Yeah. yeah. I do have it in my but notes, it, but I just... It was pretty... Yeah, I've got the label, but I don't have it right here. It's in, in my studio. Yeah. Because I'll, I'll be honest, when I was doing the assessment, I, I just initially forgot about the, the marriage aspect. I, I just... Because it's... it. Um, it's everything, everything uh, that's there looks um, nice. You know, I'm just, it, well, I was so I, pleased with it. Yeah. yeah I, I, when I did my, my just flip through the book, it, if you're looking for it, it's obvious that it has the, it's, so yeah. it's not the cover that's married, but it's the first wrap. Yeah. And maybe it was the first two wraps, but it's, uh, it's really a beautiful book. And we know that, you know, 80% of your grade, your technical grade with CGC is in the cover. Yep. So defects in the first and second rep, they, they just get discounted quite a bit, right? Yeah. So it but does not these... degrade nearly as hard as a problem with the cover. And this cover, other than the tape, is really magnificent for the grade. It, it really presents is. incredibly well. Yeah. And I, I, I only saw I overlooked again because it was the first... It was interior wraps, but also um, oftentimes, especially these golden age books that had, you know, they were just, you know, get them off the press, get them into the stand so kids can buy them. The production cuts varied on some of the issues dramatically. So I've done some marriages where it's all original parts, but sometimes the interior pages, the way they're cut, no matter how you insert it into the book, there's going to be a fanning of interior pages. It's just going to look a yep. little less desirable than something that's totally flush. And it just is a, a reality of uh, some marriage jobs, the way the production cut is. So on this one, I, I overlooked it because the cut's very close to how the rest of the book was. bronzeville has got my back. He said the other important thing that happens in All-Star 8 is that also Dr. Midnight joins. Thank you. I appreciate uh -huh. that. See, it was uh -huh. slipping my mind. I knew there was something <laughs> else important about that book. <laughs> uh, so... It's in your hands now, and you're going to walk us through your assessment. Yeah. So as, as is standard for, for books like this, um, of course, I can't know for certain uh, until I start um, uh, beyond you know initial spot tests. But the spot tests I, I did for the tape removal seemed... Um, thumbs up and the tape, you know, generally speaking, you can, I've done this enough where I can tell when there's going to be significant tape loss, uh, excuse me, color loss. There paper are exceptions, loss, of course. Paper loss after, yeah. Oftentimes you can see paper and color loss. Sure. Sometimes the, um, the damage from the adhesive is so great. It's eaten away, not just the color, but it's starting to eat away. 
Uh, right. Uh, or the, the paper itself was already basically pulp when they put the tape on. Right. Yeah. That's another yeah. situation where this, this one seemed to have all of the right hallmarks of a good fixer upper. And so yeah. I'm glad to hear that your, your double check of that, your assessment of it is, is bearing out. Yeah. What one telltale sign that uh, you should proceed with caution is if you're looking at the book and you see the color underneath the tape is already discolored versus what the natural color of the rest of the cover is. And then you can presume that, uh, you know, <laughs> taking the tape off is going to help the book, but a lot of the colors already been compromised and it is what it is. So again, I, I didn't see that in this case, which is a, which is a good sign. So, so uh, taking that into account, um, standard standard process i'm gonna um, disassemble the book remove the cover dry clean uh it doesn't need much it's uh it just has a minimal amount of you know dirt um not really much debris uh, that's stuck to the cover that's like one of the other yeah it's i'm getting it's, so excited just listening to you talk about the work <laughs> man I, i'm seriously I so geeked for this book man it's so it's so like i'm i i'm not you know, I'm, I'm human too, and I, I'm certainly not perfect, but I, I'm very methodical when I'm doing the work on, on, on the books, and it is surgery. So I, I know like dry cleaning and pressing, when people talk about it, there's a lot of assumptions. Dry cleaning is just erasing, but, you know, oftentimes too, you have a nice dull blade and you're scraping away little tiny things that are stuck to the cover, and all those things that you work on and help get off that weren't there originally make the difference in the overall eye appeal, and it makes a big a big difference so i love yeah. um i love cleaning it up and getting all that stuff off so. yeah just like just like cgc talks about an accumulation of defects determining the grade when we reverse that during conservation it's the removal of an accumulation of a whole bunch of tiny defects that improves the grade as well right and and to that point too i've done this enough where i try my best to exercise discretion like for example if you know you guys have worked on books sometimes there's you don't, you don't know exactly, but there's little tiny, uh, hard, it's like a, a hard substance, you know, maybe the kid was eating a candy bar and it's little, whatever it is. And as you're scraping it off, it's already pulled the color off. You know, the color underneath those spots is compromised. So you have to make a choice. Do I leave some of those on or do I remove that from a, a, the, the red in the title? So if you remove, you're going to have little dots now where you can see it. And you're like, well, that kind of scene is counter productive you know you don't want to do that but you don't want to leave debris on there so you kind of have to make a call sometimes yeah um, absolutely yeah this stuff can be it really can be surgery sometimes so um, you know not every member of the jsa has their own cover i mean his first appearance with this guy i mean yeah. that's a cool you know, cover i like uh, it. the adam doesn't his first appearance he's not on the cover wonder woman's not on the cover in her first appearance uh what Black Canary is not on the cover in her first appearance. So in the golden age, we don't always get, in fact, we often didn't get the hero on the cover for their first appearance. So uh, I can't, I just, I couldn't be more excited about seeing what to do with this film. <laughs> I'm psyched, man. Um, so going through the list though, overall paper quality, it's outstated. It's nice. Um, you know, a uh, little, little creamy, but mostly off white. Um, now I noticed before we move on from that, I noticed that first wrap, the one that's married in, it definitely has worse paper quality. I was a little concerned that it might be brittle. Are you, do you have any concerns really? about that wrap? No, I think there's a difference between, um, sustaining, um, uh, I don't know how to how to say it exactly. It's not like it's weathered over the course of time. It just had some incidents that happened that caused, you know, some damage. You know, so it's the difference between you know, again, like being subjected to bad conditions over the long course of time and it's all brittle. It's just it's rough. It, some of the edges yeah. are rough, and if yeah. you know, um, probably going to need casting for sure. Yeah. Uh, so so. Uh, First things first, though. So before I ever remove tape, too, I always dry clean first. Um, it might have been uh, <clears throat> Kenny uh, Sanderson who told me this. If not, it was um, Steve Cooper. I can't remember at this point. It was one of the two. But um, whenever you're, even if you're giving the the cover, you know, a solvent bath to help loosen the the adhesive, you still want to remove as much 
dirt from the cover as you can so it's not in any way going to be absorbed into the paper fibers which just makes sense yeah, um, yeah. so you dry this clean is, this is the way oh, that i do it as well yeah and we could we could put Larry on the spot because I think he wet cleans first and then dry cleans. No, actually, that's not true. I, I do dry clean. What I'll do is I'll I'll humidify it, press it flat so it's perfectly smooth. I'll dry clean it, and then it gets its bath. Oh, my bad. Yeah. Okay. There is like a weird line where like I've, I've, I've washed um, books and solvent and then been able to dry clean with no issues whatsoever so it's but it is more i just try to i try to get into the habit of doing it that way i i don't look back and i'm like oh you, should, you know so it's always dry clean first that's just yeah you don't want to create a potential tide line somewhere and exactly. so i exactly. think it it's considered um certainly in the conservation like peer-reviewed literature it's considered best practice to do any dry cleaning first yeah, yeah. I, I i generally don't show it in the videos because people have seen yeah, it's yeah. just kind of it sucks. There's sucks a lot of that thing. content out they're, there. They're, yeah. they're, they're yeah. going to click right through that part, so <laughs> <laughs> I want to spare them. Yeah. Uh, so nothing undisclosed, and then if you want to skip to the next slide, that's really the the, the yeah. roundabout. Um, I tried my best to take a picture to kind of show the the first wrap is entirely split and reattached with multiple pieces of tape that you can see. Uh, kind of is that translucent blue up, up along yeah. the spine there. Mm -hmm. so. so remind me the first, was the entire first wrap married or just the first half of the first wrap married with tape in? I, we'll have to look at the label, but I believe it's the whole, it's the full wrap. I thought it was too. So it's odd that it would be yeah. a split wrap taped together and then married in. Yeah. Well, that's an unlucky wrap, <laughs> yeah, but I guess it, it survived hard. better <laughs> than, the native one that was with that the book was born with. <laughs> yeah, it was odd how it has the original cover, but not the first half. How would that happen? But right, stranger yeah. things have happened, I suppose. <laughs> so um, yeah, so the main goal is to you know to soak the cover in this first wrap, uh, get the carrier off, scrape all the remaining adhesive off, and then and then the next order of business will be to assess the wraps and kind of see what we're working with, but. Um, no need to jump the gun first things first. So that's just the preliminary preliminary assessment and, uh, and course of action plan that we yeah, implement. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so you'll do this work and we'll have another update to this project uh, in the future. We'll do another segment. Yeah. We'll just yeah. sort of take it as we go. And um, when I sent this to Phil, I said, listen, y you know, it's it can be a uh, it can be a hammock project if necessary. I don't want to jump into your queue, and um, so he's not under any hurry or deadline on this. the The important thing is to do right by the book, and and I don't usually doing right by the book is by far the most important thing to me. But also, we wanted to, like I said, in this one, we we thought we had a real special opportunity to create some equity. So, oh yeah. So oh, yeah. that's our secondary goal. So that's it what we the, had for prepared material today. The um, cover on that copy really is like you. That was a. a it's a such a great candidate for the, oh, the really, stuff. It, it looks it great. Yeah, I like that cover. Yeah. Sorry, guys, I missed the last ten seconds. What'd you say, Phil? We were just talking your book up and saying how uh, it's such a great. You know, it's it's. I, yeah. There isn't like a big piece. It's like there's a big crease where you're like, oh, it's going to be a nice 4-0 at best. It's like it's got some real potential. It's nice. No, it, yeah. yeah, I think so too, especially if it was a 1.5 to start. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. yeah. I paid a bit for it, but, you know, for a funny book. But I also think um, – It's a good I, investment, I think. I think so. Eight, I think 83 we'll... years old too, no joke. So Yeah, that's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Love the golden age. <laughs> So, like I said, that was the prepared material we had. Uh, we did have a couple of questions that came in through either the Facebook or social media. One of them was, where do you buy your Tengujo? And I'll go ah. first. I get mine from Talus. I use the white five grams per square meter 
yes, I bought it in bulk. It's probably more than a lifetime supply for me. I, uh, many people have asked me, can't I just get like a, you know, eight and a half by 11 sheet. Sure. And I don't, I, I assume you can somewhere, but I don't know where that is. So I'm actually, I brought it up because I'm hoping either Phil or Captain Larry could tell us about it. Or um, also, Captain Larry, you could talk about the different color uh, Tengujo papers you like to use. Yeah, the as for the uh, buying it in smaller pieces, I get it from Washi Arts. And they will sell it either in a roll or uh, a square meter. Uh, and... It, a square meter will last years. Yeah, but it, it, it's, you know, <laughs> At least no as a hobbyist, it. right? And, yeah. and what I like is uh, it's priced very well. You know, I'll, I'll buy like a square meter for $9. I yeah. mean, you, you, it's kind of hard to beat that. And I work uh, the, the the different colors. I just, uh, I'll have my, my white, my standard white that everybody has. And I've been using for like the covers, it's actually a 10 gram. It's a little bit heavier. Mm, um, okay. and, and for the, uh, the, the interior wraps, the, the tans, uh, that's a six gram per, per meter. And that's, um, uh, I think that's a, a level two, uh, it, it's a, it's more of a cream color. Mm -hmm. So it really matches, uh, the, the, the normal pulp color. So it when you, does. You're, you're it doing really the is invisible. You, yeah. you, you really have to go look for it. The only way, you, and really the only way you're really going to see it is if you hit it with an ultraviolet light. Um, mm. You can, might see some mild darkening, but for the most part, because all when I do it, I'll use uh, methyl cellulose because uh, mm -hmm. it, it dries really clear and it just really blends yeah. in. Uh, when I work on the covers, I'll use the wheat paste just for the sheer strength of the wheat paste because methyl cellulose has just no strength to it. So yeah, same. I love it. Yeah, I, I have. Uh, I saw some of the first rolls I ever bought that I haven't finished because there's like, it's really for how much you need to use per book and how much they yeah. provide. It's like yeah. never, like I've had this for you'll, you'll never use a it. long time, and I, I I have you know I have two. It's funny. I have my like pure white roll that I'll use sometimes, but my slightly colored roll is the one that I've you know mostly gone. Mm. But I'll end up, you know, this was back when I was doing more traditional work, and I was layering this stuff with like Minota and like all these other things to make a variety of colors, not just these colors. For, that's here. for peace, Phil. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But. Um, this is, this you, is great. Does it Talus. matter? Is it irrelevant now uh, who you bought it from, Phil? No, I mean, I, so I, conveniently enough, I'm five subway stops away from Talos. So I can just. <laughs> uh, you know, well, I, I know, know, I know, I know where you yeah. shop. Yeah. One of the best cons conservation, you know, uh, uh, warehouses in the country is a mile, a couple miles away from me. So I'm very fortunate. That's awesome. Yeah. I need some felts from them. Maybe next time you run over. I wish some. my only complaint is pre COVID you could go in and inspect everything. So you could look at all the tissue papers, look at things. And now you can go and pick up orders, but they won't let you really in the showroom anymore, which is oh, unfortunate. That is because a, a lot of what we do is hands on and we tactile. Yeah. You want to see that. You want to and I'm like, <laughs> But, yeah, you want to okay. see those materials to get inspired yeah. sometimes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Exactly. Uh, Sky Patrol has a great question here. I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say. Best ideas to remove grease oh. pencil from cover? That's a tough one. I, I, I'm, I'm going to defer. Yeah, I'm going to defer. You go first. <laughs> Uh, so this is what I do. I actually just use a cotton round, but you need to be, you need to be very patient and you need to change out the cotton round frequently. What I have found is if you just go to town rubbing, you will lift the grease pencil into the cotton round. Now you're smearing the grease around and it will lift color from yeah. around the area. Yeah. So what you need to do in my experience, or at least this is what I do, use a cotton round, don't use too much pressure, and also go replace the cotton round as soon as you see any material at all on it, just get another one. 
because that grease pencil is greasy by definition and you're rubbing that around you're lifting color so don't do that that's, um, that's the reason i kind of backed away from that because i have never had any success removing grease pencil i've mm. lightened it but removing it you're usually taking color and doing more damage that's you know, another thing you can you know, lighten Shelby, it. Shelby, Shelby just mentioned right there. Just leave it. Yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll bring, I'll respond to that in a moment, but to your point, Larry, sometimes you, you have a lot of times, one of the keys actually to being good at comic book conservation is knowing when to stop. Yep. Uh, yep. You can lighten up grease, grease pencil, quite grease pencil quite a bit. And there'll still be a little shadow there. Sometimes mm -hmm. that's where you need to stop. Yep. Um, to, to Shelby's point, so I would say if it's if it's unobtrusive, if it's the date, something like that, sure. But we've yeah. seen really horrible examples of grease pencil where someone just took it and just just did a, a figure eight on top of Thor's face yeah. and yeah. you know stupid and stuff drew, like drew that. In, I mean, drew in a mustache or something like that. I mean, <laughs> so there are times when I don't think it's appropriate to leave it because it is very distracting. But if it's if it's just the date, if it's unobtrusive in a in a, a clear you know negative space on the cover, a hundred percent I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you I have just, anything uh, to add to that, Phil? Yeah, I was going to say, because I, whenever I think of problems like this, my brain immediately <clears throat> goes to books that I've recently worked on that I had things like this. And I worked on a, an all new, I believe it was an all new eight. It's the, what they call the poor man's suspense three. So like using words here, where if you don't know what these are at all, it means nothing. But yeah. so suspense three is the famous Schomburg uh, bondage cover. <laughs> Uh, all okay. new eight is another similar bondage cover that goes for a lot, but not as much. Uh, anyway, so it's a very it's busy. It's got a lot going on, and it had grease pencil <clears throat> at the top in the masthead. And I had uh, it's it's exactly what you both were talking about. You had to exercise discretion taking it off, and I hit the point where I realized the impact that the grease pencil immediately made in the book was that enough that you were never going to remove it totally. It was never, but you can make it look better. But if I kept going, I would have absolutely started removing yeah. natural color. And then it would have looked like, Oh, someone obviously tried. It just would have looked terrible. So I went yep. right up to the point and then I stopped and said, that's as good as it's going to go. And I left it alone. Um, yeah. And it's tough. And, and uh, you have to uh, dry cleaning and that, you know, I, I would just say, Larry, find some books online that are cheap. And, um, and just practice, you know, just like everything else, it's just practice, practice, practice. And, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and Travis has a good idea here. Um, use the Absarine. I'm pretty sure he means the Absarine putty on grease yep. pens. Takes a long time. Except, I bet that works quite well, actually. It can, yeah. but the, the number one issue that uh, just, to, just like anyone watching this too, just to think of if you're going to use this, right, it can work. But just be aware, if you're going to roll it up into like a log and start rolling it over the grease pencil, every area of the paper that the grease pencil isn't on that you're applying pressure to, you're causing unnecessary abrasion to the paper. And there's a greater chance you're going to lift color. And it's it really makes you think when you're doing this, uh, like you only want to touch the surface of what you're removing. Anything extra, you're always going to run into problems. It's just going to, it's, yeah. it's, and then you're on gonna, these old like, books, I will say, them. I love that putty on like bronze age and up or, you know, a copper age and up, I should say. Uh, I think it, it works really well. In fact, you can remove like sticker residue. You can, you can do a lot with that stuff. Um, but you need to have that newer, sturdier paper. I, Exactly. I yeah, don't right. tend to use it at all on Silver Age. And just in my mind, I know we didn't specify here grease pencil on Silver Age, but For sure. in my mind, I'm thinking it's mostly Silver Age books that suffer from the grease pencil. It was used in the in the bronze and through the Copper Ages as well. So yeah. I get it. You're I right, though. There are different. We probably could have started so. the conversation talking about it depends on which yeah. book. I bet yeah. it would work really well on a, on a Copper Age book um, with grease pencil on the cover. Yeah. Yeah. Or even um, a modern book to remove something that isn't grease pencil, but the paper is more durable, so the abstract will actually pick up some of the debris. 
Yeah, I saw another comment here that I wanted to... Here we go. Shelby's comment. Anyone ever use Tengu gum to paper? So this is essentially Tengujo with a water-soluble adhesive already on it. And you just apply it and you apply it damp and you don't have to do the separate methylcellulose or wheat paste. And so I responded to this, but I don't have any personal experience with it. I'll expand upon my response and say that in conservation circles, there we go. In conservation circles, it is an acceptable method, though it's not necessarily the preferred the preferred in like the peer reviewed conservation literature is still the Japanese paper with either wheat paste or methyl cellulose or a similar, you know, tapioca, something like that glue. Um, but, but it is an acceptable alternative, meaning it is still removable by water. And so it's not, it's not creating potential problems down the road. And I guess one of the things I don't know for sure is how CGC would react to it, but they ought to respond to it favorably, at least from my perspective, because it is acceptable in the paper conservation literature. So that's my sort of take on it, uh, more of a theoretical answer. I don't have any personal practical experience. My guess is neither of you do either, but I'll... No, I've, I've, I've never used it before. But certainly, I would think at the very least better than any archival tape. Which, for the record, oh, yeah, definitely. Ne- like, uh, again, anyone listening to this, don't make the mistake of being like, "Oh, it's archival, so I can use it." Just remember, what you're going to put it on is a thin piece of old comic paper that's not made to last, especially having any sort of tape put on it whatsoever, <laughs> be it archival or not. So just, yeah, sorry. Hate tape. Tape is evil. <laughs> yeah. And Shelby says, if you remember, I was asking because I did not want to wet the entire cover. Right. Which is exactly why I think it would be a great alternative yep. uh, to the sort of traditional method. And like I said, it ought to be acceptable. I And, you know, from a scientific perspective, uh, I would endorse the use of it. Again, I just don't have any personal experience. So Sounds cool. you might have to... Uh, yeah, you might have to try it out and let us know how it works. Yeah, I'm curious about it. Yeah, because I, I've never used it. Yeah, makes it so easier for people that want to do some work on some of their own books at home. You know, yeah, one of the stuff. things I wonder about, I've seen it. Um, I don't know how it would tear, and the 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 paper that I've seen often f- offered for sale, it's you know like a roll of tape, so it's square and has a hard edge. So one of the reasons I think that Japanese paper would be preferred in a very strict conservation setting is because you can get that nice frayed edge that almost disappears into the paper. And I, I don't know if that's, that's possible want, yeah. with this product. That would be another great thing to, um, to experiment with. So Shelby's offered to be the monkey. So we are looking forward to hearing back from you, I will say guinea pig, but monkey works too. Travis says, oh. I admit I used, oh, I think he means archival tape. I admit I used yeah. it for years. I threw out tape three weeks ago. Sorry, fellas. Oh, no. Better late nice. than never. Oh, yeah. our, thrown our, it out. Our, our archival the tape, there's yeah. no use for that in our, our work. That's I just wanted to show this too. Just to clarify, if someone did use archival tape and got universal, then that was definitely a oversight by CGC, I would imagine. Yeah, so that's not crazy. The, the, the I, exception is the, not the, the way rule. that they treat the way that they treat tape is so upside down. It's ridiculous. If you're going to allow regular scotch tape, which is clearly destroying your comic, <laughs> and universal. You need to allow archival to also be in universal. I could be wrong, and maybe this is a policy that they've enacted, but to my knowledge, any tape uh, that's archival, they will hit you with um, something other than universal, but regular tape is okay for universal. So as Paul was saying. It's, no. Yeah. Travis <laughs> says, I have many books with archival tape and blue labels. Well, um, 
again, I, I thought that was not the way that they did it, but Maybe if they, that is, it. they did it good, because that's what it ought to be. <laughs> in my opinion, if you're going to, I mean, frankly, actually, personally, it's all I'd, rather, all. Yeah. I'd rather tape across the board be considered restoration because it's destroying <laughs> books. I really do. I, I think they took the wrong <clears throat> stance. I understand why they did it, but I think it's incorrect. So I for, if I had a perfect world, it would all be considered restoration. Then you could actually start to make the, uh, the, the argument well, if regular scotch tape is restoration, maybe archival tape is conservation, and I think you might be able to reasonably argue that. Yeah. But giving giving scotch tape a free pass and putting it in universal and then treating archival like a redheaded stepchild is just ridiculous to me. Um, I completely agree. So there it is. Uh, I don't see any other questions here. I want to thank everybody for the questions here. But we do actually have a question going back to episode one that uh, I think will be fun to put to Captain Larry here. Uh -oh. So when we did our origin stories, Captain Larry mentioned the way that uh, he and his siblings used to um, <laughs> do sort of amateur work on comic books as children uh, my, and my he, brother fancied himself an artist yes made an offhand comment about doing some uh, as a young man doing some restoration <laughs> some amateur restoration on a thirty thousand dollar comic book and we actually had several listeners say what what book was, was that? it <laughs> uh it was it was a uh, 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 amazing spider-man it was a number one, but of course it was a, um, uh, it wasn't a pristine copy. And uh, yeah, he, he would took a ballpoint pen and tracing paper. And then uh, I, if I remember right, he took a, 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 a pin or a needle and just poked the paper all the way around. <laughs> yeah. Just Yep. That's how you do a ponce. That's 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 where you take yeah. that and you ponce it onto another surface, right? <laughs> yeah. Smart. Yeah. Yeah. Smart. yeah. He, was, he, well, he was he was he was good. Yeah. He did a great job. And uh, I I don't have that book any any longer. Uh, it was before I even knew that it even had a value because it was it was destroyed. But he wow. he, he liked that uh, Spider Man cover, and uh, yeah, that was that was it. And I I I may I guilted him many many times over this <laughs> that, as an adult. So, but yeah, that that's what it was. It was ASM one. Well, that was worth the wait for the reveal. <laughs> I enjoyed that. That's a big wow. Part. Yeah, yeah, it was painful. I yeah, absolutely. Was... Was... <clears throat> uh, from when I was a kid, my dad gave me. Uh... Uh, I mean, among all the books he gave me, I had a stack of uh, 50s Donald Duck books that were some of my favorite to read. So mm -hmm. I would like, when growing up going to antique stores, those were some of the ones I, I would seek out. And I had one, great for that. Yeah. I had one, it's the, I think, Dell 406. It's the one where he's holding up the golden helmet. Like nice, like classic. Oh, cover. yeah, yeah. This and is it, a famous Carl's Bark story. Yeah, the the, co the copy I got in an antique store, um, it was rough. And I remember as a little, as a kid, I went to my dad, like, Dad, I know I shouldn't put tape on this, but it's falling apart. Can I put, is it okay to put some tape like here at the spine? He was like, Yep, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to stop you. So, probably, and like I put it on there. And I think if I'm not wrong, it's, it's either still. Like two of the three pieces I was able to remove, but one I was like, I got to kind of leave it alone or it's going to just hold paper off. And it's like, but wow. the book is already very low grade. It has a lot of damage because I was, wasn't a savvy buyer as a kid anyway. So it's okay. But still I was like, oh man, like you, you, you know, you're not supposed to do it, but you, you can't help yourself. It's like, I, yeah. I didn't have comics, but I did that to my Game Boy games and the labels. You just start peeling it off or writing on it you just mm -hmm. you don't think about, about it you just do it <laughs> so funny enough i came to comic books a little bit older and already with like a collector mindset i had already been instilled with like the stamp collecting and the coin collecting stuff that was popular oh, okay. in the 80s and so i came to comic books around the age of 10 and don't have any horror stories like that myself personally 
because I was already like from day one, I was basically like, I'm a collector and I was, I didn't buy bags and boards yet, but I was putting them all in a box and trying to take care of them. I will tell a funny story about my brother though. So my brother was a huge X-Men fan and a huge Wolverine fan in particular. And so when the Wolverine limited series came out, um, help me guys, 80, 82. Yeah, I think 82. It yeah, it was 82. Yeah. He snatched them all up and he read them and read them and just was quoting it all the time. He, he actually, he narrated the book into a tape recorder so he could listen to it or just because he enjoyed <laughs> reading it. Nerd. And then I love it. He'd awesome. been, he had read it so many times. He was like, mom, you know, I really need to preserve these. And my mom was like, well, you know how you preserve paper things? You laminate them. Oh, no. <laughs> so he was like, that sounds good to me. Then I could take it everywhere and read it as many times as I want, wherever I am. And it wouldn't get damaged. So my mom took them down to wherever you did laminations yeah. back in the day because we didn't have uh, Kinkos, Kinkos at the time. I don't, I don't know where that would have been. But yeah, anyway. Laminating was, that wasn't cheap either back then. Back then. She, she, <laughs> she <laughs> had <laughs> issues one through four. And by the way, these were newsstand copies. We didn't have a comic shop around us growing up. We grew oh, up man. in a rural area. And um, so issues one through four newsstand all laminated beautifully, still preserved to this day, guys. Nice. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, later in life, my brother had to rebuy all those issues because he couldn't look at those laminated copies. And and actually, he said, "I, you know, funny enough, when I got after I had been cleaning and pressing for about a year, he sent them to me, and um, the the later copies that he had purchased, and I cleaned and pressed all of them, subbed them all to CGC for him. So oh, he's nice. now got some a high grade." collection of his favorite books see, and he's I'm got cruel. his reader copies that have been laminated lovingly by my mom i would That's be cruel awesome. and i would frame all those laminated copies and hang them in the house for him to see every time he visits <laughs> no he's got them he owns them yeah <laughs> i'm pretty sure they're in a they're still in a box those might be the ones that he uh, teaches his his boys to read with you know i mean hey, comics are comics the last. They, they're here to be used <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I love that. All right. Well, unless anybody has any better horror stories than that, I think we can wrap up our show this week with that. And um, yeah, great story. Not embarrassing at all for my brother. He'll appreciate that. Yeah. My, my <laughs> brother was definitely embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you guys have coming up this week? Um, I'm still going to be on the road. I'm not sure where I'm going to be at the uh, next week. Um, I've got some stuff in the hopper right now. Uh, no, I'll, I'll, I, I'm not sure what I'm going to have for next week. All right. Phil, anything new and exciting for the week coming up? Um, some cool books. Um, Ooh. big, a big, uh, big assortment of, uh, restoration removal books. I got to get to, there's a, a, uh, I can say the word, but I can't say anything beyond that, but it, there's a cap too. I got to do a little bit of stuff on, which is obviously oh. fun, a fun, cool oh. book to see a copy of in person, you know, the first round shield, you know, another classic, <laughs> scarcely the same book. So, guys cool. uh, phil works on some big books for some whales from time to time and he's not always at liberty to share them because you know those folks tend to be sometimes secretive i can't um, post that one i'll only mention it now that's why it's like fun to you know, yeah so he that, so that. definitely follow him on instagram he posts what he can but there's so much going on behind the curtain it's it's uh it's really amazing and uh, obviously, it's a testament to his skill that he's people trust him with those books. So anyway, thanks again for joining me, uh, Phil and Larry. Thanks, all of the viewers. Everybody have a great week and take care of one another. See you, everybody. We'll Bye, see everybody. you next week.